Now, one of the topics that has come up over the years many times, and I, I always try to explain what my philosophy is very, very quickly and simply, but let me just expound on that just a little bit. We all start out, when you design a plane, in theory anyway, you start out that the ratio of flap travel, at least let's, let's use a nobler as an example, that the control ratio, you set up the control system so that as the flap moves one degree, the elevator moves one degree. And that's called basically a one-to-one -one system. Also, if you go way back in time, you'll remember ships like the Ares that that basically were designed around a three-to-two hookup. In other words, the elevators had move three degrees every time the flaps moved two degrees. And that seemed to work. The relationship always was, if you can avoid walking into the camera, was that this worked well on a relatively heavy ship, this worked well on a really light ship. Now in the past we've also made pattern masters, for instance, that had four to five ratios and various things in between. But, but our objective always is to start off trimming a plane, at least in the first getting friendly and used to the plane, with having a one-to-one -one ratio. But what we always try to do, and in the case of Miss Ashley, we have never even tried these other ratios, we have three choices. And what we're going to do right now, we're going to take the plane apart, because that's what's nice about a take apart plane, and just experiment a bit. We know that one to one seems to work pretty well. We're going to try, the next time we get a flying session, is just moving the elevators just a little bit more than the flaps. And we have that bushing already installed in the elevator horn. We just need to move the push rod up. Relatively simple job. But the point is, if you want to experiment like this, this is real easy when you have a take apart plane. Real easy when you don't walk into the camera. Real, you can tell I'm having a, a hang over here from this gnat strip. Anyway, this whole section comes off, and we can get in at the at the control system. Now it also on the Spitfires, which were not take-apart planes, back here, Joe had designed in what amounted to be a hatch that you could get in, unsoldered a link, and move it down to the next hole. And on Joe's yellow Spitfire, he's done a lot of experimenting with different ratios. We're going to be doing even more experimenting because he's flying. That yellow Spitfire is very soon going to have a Sato in it. And so a lot of times you have a trim choice here that as you change the CG in the plane, and I want to explain what I'm trying to accomplish here. What I'm what I'm looking for here is Miss Ashley right from the get-go had a real nice corner. I'm not looking for more corner. But a lot of times by backing down on the flap a little bit, which is what we'll be doing, we'll be moving the elevators not quite three to two, but maybe somewhere in the neighborhood of four to five the little bit less flap travel tends to slow it down less in a corner. Now in the case of putting a four stroke in the plane, which is what Joe has done, you can turn a much bigger propeller. And so what the bigger propeller allows you to do is go in the other direction where you can move the flaps more than the elevators. And there's advantages and disadvantages to both. But the ultimate thing is to be able to adjust it, to fine tune it, to suit that exact plane and of course your exact flying needs. Oh, another choice you have, and this is something we've done in the past with the yellow cardinal specifically, is we went to the field and we wanted to try different ratios, but we didn't have an adjustable control system. Still there's another way to do it. You can take a little piece of balsa wood, and in this case you could use maybe an eighth by quarter, and just scotch tape it to the back of the flap, so in essence the flaps are bigger. And what that would allow you to do is see what the result would be if you were to speed up the flap travel, in other words more flap travel relative to the elevator. Then if you didn't like this you can just take the tape off and say gee that didn't help at all. You could do the same thing back here and make the elevators a little more effective. Again if the elevators are shaped, and just to make an example up, they usually end at about an eighth of an inch. You can just take a piece of eighth inch balls or a quarter inch and put some scotch tape on it. Now it's a good idea if you do this, be aware that you can pull the paint up off the plane too. So you want to you take that tape and stick it to something else 
so that it doesn't pull the paint up and use it the second time you push it down. The same way you don't want to pull the tape up when you're doing a paint job. But this would give you another way of trying different control ratios if you didn't have a hatch, if you didn't have an adjustable horn. But the, the, the feeling that I always have is, is I try to do these kind of tests, and we've done this with the Cardinals, and we're, we're going to do it with Miss Ashley. If you have the adjustable controls, and in our case with Miss Ashley, we can just pull the wires out of the flaps, make another set of flaps smaller, another set bigger, which we did on the original Miss Ashley. We made carbon fiber flaps. Well, it's always the best to have the most adjustability built into the plane. And it's always not in your favor to have things that once you build a plane, you can't get at them. It's always, just think of the most obvious, the motor in a tank. If you built the motor in a tank into the plane and you could never get it out, well, wow, that would be a real problem. The reason we want to do this so aggressively is because we only have really about three weeks left before we get our concrete field back. When we get our concrete field back, or I should say paved field, we want to be flying a B-25 from that point in the year until we actually leave for England. So we're trying to segment up what's left of the year into, into distinct, as had bird just flies by, into some distinct test things that we'd like to use the rest of the year to test thought from looking over the Nats videos that Miss Ashley just performed as well as I could have ever expected an experimental plane but there's still more to try and, and the time was limited before the Nats we didn't get to try the elevator ratios so that's one of the things if we get a fly-in day in the next three weeks that we can dedicate to trying that we're going to set the plane up ahead of time so we can just run out to the field and try it typically when we get back from the Nats we're really really busy for a couple of weeks so the time may be limited, but that's one of the things I wanted to try. Again, I, if, I, if I found that more elevated travel was a way to go, what I could do in essence is just make up bigger elevators. Tape that little piece on if I thought that would help. But go, by going back and forth, you always will find something that you didn't have the other way. It'll always change. Now if it changes for the worse, pretend that let's make a scenario up we try a little more elevated travel the plane gets less flyable well what does that tell you we'll go in the other direction and move the flaps more but by fine-tuning it I don't like having a slider in the back I'm always afraid that's going to get loose right on walk or fly off day or top 20 day or whatever but I'd rather have the holes and have a way of permanently putting it in position so it never changes and that's that's we've built that right into this plane and pretty much all of the plane all of the take apart planes have that choice that we can just take the back piece off and get in there at the pool. We actually could do the same thing with the Typhoon also. So that's one of the choices that we have. One of the things you buy by having a take apart plane or a hatch in the back. Now, what we're all building up here to is because we're going to be test flying a B-25, we've started out with the ratios being one to one. That's always the point I think it's best to start at. But there's a reality check here. The B-25 is, if, if not too heavy, it's on the heavy side. So I'm guessing right away that if we, if we do have the time this year to try all the choices, we may even wind up with more flap travel, which typically happens on four-stroke installations. You can use more flap travel because of the larger prop diameters. We may wind up with less elevated travel and flap travel because the wing is small relative to the overall weight. But again, because it's a take-apart plane, we can get in there and adjust the ratios. So the, the point that I'm trying to make is if you've, built, if you've built a nobler and you can't get in and change anything without cutting the plane, you're probably just going to fly it out for its entire life and never make any fine-tuning adjustments. If you allow yourself the choice of removing the flaps with bigger flaps or changing the ratios, you'll find just by experiment, you'll find something that's probably just a little better than one to one. The trouble is it takes flight after flight after flight, evaluate, evaluate, videotape. We didn't have the time to do that before the Nats, but we're going to have the time to do it now. And we hope we're going to put all that data into the database so that when it comes time to fly to B-25, and we're going to start at one to one. If we see flight characteristics that we think we've trimmed out in other planes and just to make an example the yellow cardinal was very light the original yellow cardinal and when I made the flaps bigger the corner totally disappeared when I took a razor and cut a quarter inch off the flaps the plane came to life like 
like a dynamite stick. So I had the original plane because it was only 54 ounces, was very light, didn't need the flap travel, didn't need the width, the size of the flaps. This plane, I think, may even need more flap than we have. Again, we're trying to generate as much lift as we can. All this always assumes that the, ten the hinge lines are always taped, always. We never would fly the plane without the hinge lines taped. Now, the other part of this, I always build slop into the controls. Now, there are, there are certainly people with counterpoints. They prefer ball links or controls that are very tight. A couple of things that I've thought of. I go over and check a lot of planes. Even when people aren't looking, I'll just grab the flap, move the elevator, and I see virtually every plane I've ever checked has some slop. What we're talking about is how much. Now, the, the amount of slop I prefer is in the control horn. If I have an eighth inch hole and a 332nd wire, that's easy to deal with because I can build a plane, put a little piece of fuel tank tubing in here that lines up everything at neutral, take the fuel tank tubing out, and that push rod will be completely centered in that hole with the same amount of slop on both sides. Now, years ago, Bob Gildini wrote about the benefits of slop, and I think he was the one that probably was uh, the one that brought this to everybody's attention, that old planes always seem to fly better than new planes. And that was one of the reasons. I think one of the reasons, and you can pick your reason. If you think there's another reason, this is not the, the like some set in stone thing, but this is my reasoning. When a plane sits out in the sun, and you can measure this with a laser, by the way, T take a plane, put it out in the sun, in the brightest sun, for an hour and go measure the wing, and you'll see the wing, at the end of an hour, the wing is starting to droop down. I've measured even four numbers on the laser that it droops down from the sun beating on one side, which expands that side and pushes the wing down. I've seen people leave the plane, Billy Suarez, for instance, leave the plane upside down so that it would warp the other way. Well, we all know the body has to be doing the same thing. We, what I think happens with the slop is it allows any misalignment that you might have, and you might have a little misalignment in the motor, you might have a little misalignment here, a little mis... It, it could be that everything's perfect, but the heat of the day has bowed this up to some degree. Well, we don't really know, but I know for a fact that if you put a little bit of slop in the controls, typically you can put it on either side, as long as it's on the push rod that connects these two together. If you put that slop in there, the plane always seems to do two things. It flies level flight on rails. It'll come out of a corner. Now, when you see planes at the Nats, you'll see, bless them, it has a word for it. He calls it ferreting. They come out of a corner and go, well, a lot of times, that's you're still trying to set all your neutrals back, where if you come around and everything's got a little slop in it, everything just goes right back into position. Again, it's a debatable point. We're not looking to, to make the case that we have some knowledge that there's no counterpoint. There may be a counterpoint. And it, the counterpoint might be that super expert flyers can deal with a lot less slop, but lower skill level people or people that fly under different conditions, this will benefit them. The best thing of all, what's the best thing of all? Is if this doesn't work and you say, oh gee, I tried Wendy's method, it doesn't work. You take the push rod off, the push rod end would be like this. Put that little piece of brass fuel tubing on, solder on your washer, and then you have no slop. Well, the best of all worlds is if you can try it both ways and decide for yourself. And this, this little method with the fuel tank tubing, which is on all the videos for the last 10 years, this seems to give you a choice that you don't otherwise have. It's an excellent choice. So if you combine all of the choices that I've just gone over, if you can vary your control ratio with different adjustments in the horn setup, either by taking a part over the hatch, you can remove your flaps, or just add little pieces to the end, or in the worst of all worlds, if you see making them bigger went in the wrong direction, try cutting an eighth inch off the flaps. If you've built a real heavy plane, the heavier the plane may be, the more it's going to need the flap hinge lines taped, even though I know Billy Wurridge and he's probably got the lightest of the modern stunners, his are always taped. Consider moving the flaps just a little bit more as one way of getting a little more lift. And moving the flaps a little more is going to make for more drag, so consider a bigger prop diameter. Last little 
way of fine tuning a plane, always allow yourself the option of having some slop in the controls. Now we're living in a really wonderful age of, of model aviation. So many parts are available, so many good things. I think most people, maybe there's a few exceptions, wind up using, like I do, a traditional arrow shaft with no adjustment, basically. That would be the standard, I'll let's call it the standard by which uh, we're trying to make things happen. What, what I've done in the past, and we're probably going to have to do it to the B-25, is if we want to change that, what I have to do is pretty much make another push rod with a, jo a slip joint here, and there's a lot of ways to do this too. My first choice would be to do it this way, some copper wire and solder it, and then I could fine tune the length. If I see my handle needs the cable way down on one side or the other, what it means is I should adjust the push rod beyond one or two little slots on the handle. This would tend to make the plane turn equally. Well, there's other ways of people have come up with doing it, and Old Rindak has a lot of good ways with the ball links and adjustable, the ultra hobby push rods. There's a thousand different ways, and this, this is the way I've always chosen to do it. There's also another way, the Bill Biles has it, it goes on to push rod. We have one of the, I don't know who has it. Somebody borrowed it and never gave it back, but we had a Bill Biles adjuster. Now this would be my final way of doing this, and this, is, this would be the ultimate way. I would have this as close to the CG as possible. This is the little threaded adjuster. But also, when I'm all done and I'm at the field, got the exact length dialed in, the exact length I want, I'd then take a piece of aluminum. You could go buy a piece of channel iron, aluminum at, at Home Depot, something like that. And I'd drill two really accurate holes in it. So those holes, that push rod would just drop into those holes and it would have the adjuster on it or whatever. Then I would make another push rod without an adjuster. Because once it's adjusted, you're done. It's not like adjustable leadouts. You're not going to change this every time you fly. But this would be a tool to use to set up your final push rod length, which would be you could mark it and then build yourself a push rod with the little slop in the ends and then fill it with carbon fiber the way we've done a million times on video. And that gauge would now you'd eliminate this part and you could use it again in the next plane assuming you're building a plane with the same tail moment arm if you weren't you could just bolt take it out the other thing I would suggest if you do one of these they the plugs they JB weld in and I've heard that it's real reliable they JB weld into the inside of an arrow shaft there's a couple of problems that I see that could possibly happen the inside of the arrow shaft is a molded part so you want to scuff that up as as well as you can with 80 grit paper, roughen it up, get the JB weld in there, hit it with a little bit of a heat gun, maybe even wrap this with some carbon fiber. And when it's all dry, I would drill a 64th hole right through the center of it, if we were looking at it this way, drill a hole right through the center and put a press pin or a cotter pin in it. And that would ensure that there's no way that would ever come out. There's no way you would ever have a problem. JB Weld is probably real reliable. Bill Biles reports that it's it's never failed on him. The problem with things like this is highly skilled modelers, and Bill Biles is probably a highly skilled model. He would already know to etch the inside of this, clean it up, make sure everything. And and somebody at a lower skill level would just take some five minute glue and shove it in there. Well, we're trying to trying to make it that there's no chance whatsoever that these parts will fail in service. So if you look at having all of these choices in your control system, well, we're going to go get Miss Ashley off the uh, rack here, and we'll, we'll have about a three-week time that we can try different ratios and see if, and if we don't make any improvement at all. The best of all worlds is if, if you find nothing that makes it any better, you put it all back right where it was, you've not gained or lost anything. It's the best of all worlds. But if you don't know the, about these, if, if, it's not, if you're not aware of these possibilities. Let's pretend you had a plane. Let's pretend you had a, you know, a cardinal. And for the whole life of the plane, you've lived with something that isn't right, or that it didn't turn equally, or it didn't turn tight enough, or it turned too tight. Any one of the, and and you would always be just a five-minute little fix away from having it perfect. It'd be a shame. And we've put a lot of this literature into our catalogs over the years. 
this is the ones we've had in the shop and the ones I've done for other people they've worked out very well Bill's phone number Bill's email I think you can pull it right off of there phone number is 909 318 2580 the assembly weighs four grams that's not an issue at all if you build a plane that won't carry four extra grams I'm not sure you're building the right plane anyway just some thoughts on getting your control system fine tuned up no matter what plane you're building no matter what kind of motor you have if you know how to do it you'll always be able to get more performance out of it now with the gnats behind us the first thing we need to do here is get rid of the the pavement gear we'll probably not be flying on pavement again until we get to our field in Palisade Park and in the meantime, when we do get to that field, we're going to be flying a B-25. So the rest of this year, we'll probably fly out with Miss Ashley on grass. We've many times put on a video what the benefits and the pros and cons of having two sets of landing gear are. No sense reiterating that, but it served us well having those gear. And I don't think we bounced a single landing at the Nats and a, or, or a single takeoff that was, that was really terrible. So I think they did serve us well. You look down with one pavement gear on, we get a good alignment. You can see how much further forward the grass gear go than the pavement gear. Now even the best, you know, let's assume you build the best plane on the planet, the best plane you're capable of, and you never get it fine-tuned. Well, what good is that? That isn't doing much good either. Now I just want to show, let's see if I can, if we can back the camera up just a little bit. This is an important thing. A lot of people never get to see this or they don't, they don't realize how significant it is. I'm going to hold the flaps steady. See the flaps aren't moving? And that's how much slop at that control ratio seems to work well for us it up to use the what amounts to be about a four to five ratio here I think we're gonna put this bird on another control ratio anyway we will get to see if a little bit more elevator puts this in a little friendlier position if it doesn't we know we can always go right back and the other choice we have is we can take a little piece of copper tubing to the field and try running it without slop and with slop and see make a decision on our own just assuming we're in the next couple of days we're going to get a flight day the day we can run out and check this having all these little possibilities we could do the rest of it right at the field we can put the slop back in and out move the control ratio because it's just loosening and tightening a wheel collar but this will give us one little bit more information of things we'll know uh, in the future and hopefully some information we'll be able to use when we trim the B-25. Pretty much everything we're doing is geared toward just getting that B-25 in the air in the next two or three weeks. And today's mail, Warren Walker sent us another set of photos now that his plane's been flown. A Strega built from plans, Super Tiger 60. Now he's already got flights on this and very happy with the way it's flying so far. Some nice creative lettering with combining the 7 and the Strega in one logo. I like that. But Tyser will like that. Looks like he has a, uh, a Tom Lay muffler on it. He's got some neat little letter sets on here on the bottom of it. looks like the bottom of the outer wing. It says, thanks to my good friend, Wendy Ertnowski, for all your help. That's very nice. He's also got something on the other wing on the top that I think is cool as can be. And it says, fly it like you have no time or money invested. 
Bob H. I'm assuming that's Bob Hoover. Again, some of the nice letter set work Warren has done on a plane. I like the rudder too. The American flag rudder is real nice. In fact, there's a shot here. Get one more shot here. And of course, our good friend Gorham's. He says this is a picture after the first flight, and he was really happy with the way it worked out. He also sent a picture. Now, Warren, I got I got to preface this story. Warren always sends me he, he home grows his own pickles. He sent me. I thought this was a marijuana plant. What do I know? It's a pickle plant. Anyway, we're expecting our next shipment of pickles soon. Karen's already getting her getting her appetite ready. A couple of pictures Percy Atfield gave me at the Nat, some nice pictures here. I think these are cool. These are of Brodak, of course, when we lined up all the scale planes. There's one here I really like. <clears throat> now, Percy's caption I will not get into, but I'll show you the next one. I won't even read Percy's caption. You figure out what it is. <laughs> anyway, thanks to everybody. Hey, we're just waiting for some weather to get out to the flying field here. And it doesn't look like it's coming today or tomorrow. Looks like we got a, uh, a reasonably nice overcast day here. We're going to try our new control ratio setup, see if we like it better. but. The trick here is you don't want to make the decision on the first day. You want to give it a couple of days. So we'll give this a couple of days. It looks like a bunch of people are already here. Anyway, after a couple of days, we'll make a decision. Do we want to stay with this or go on and try some other ratios? At least we'll find out if we're going in the right direction or not today. He's here every day. Watch this. Check it out. What is it? He catches woodchucks in his backyard. We don't even know who this guy is. He just he comes in in a Lincoln. Not to let him go by the road, but he lets him go by the road anyway. Why doesn't he go back in the woods and let him go? Because the poor guy's going to run right into the street and yeah, and get whacked. Well, he doesn't look like the brightest bulb on the tree either. How do you catch a woodchuck? No, they have a garden. My neighbor traps them, but he takes them, you know, 20 miles away. They eat all your vegetables. Why doesn't he put them right out in the middle of the road? That's pretty smart. Oh, what's the stick for? Oh, look at this. This guy's a rocket scientist. You don't release scientist. them, right? He's he's a, a shit out of them with the stick. Look at this. Look at this. Look what we have to deal with. Whoop! Da 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 da. That looks like a squirrel. It looks like a squirrel to me. Okay. Thanks. All right. Getting raindrops here, so it doesn't look like we're gonna get anything done today. At least it's starting to look like a raindrop day. Oh man. Well. We live to fight another day here. Oh, it looks like it's going to rain. Brian's got his Tesla plane. Boy, this thing, I remember when this went in. <laughs> this is one of the repairs. And I broke it twice since. <laughs> well, keep up the good work. Flip it. You got, this is a motor you got from England? Yeah, the Marco 61. Okay, we haven't seen this. Oh, this is the... Yeah. Get some of the dirt off of there. How big is the Venturi on that? It's uh, it's like 312 now. I opened it up, but it was okay. still around 300. Okay. And Tommy Tommy Hampshire uh, did his little heat ring deal on there. I don't know yeah, right, right. Because it was it wasn't running. It would sit there and I would die out, inverted and stuff like oh, that. Oh yeah. And then we finally got finally only plug it would run on was a Fox plug. Yeah. So Tommy took and did the head, mailed it back to me. Now it runs on you know pretty much anything I put in there. So we got a Thunderbolt in there. Yeah. And what pitch is this? Yeah, a six that's pitch? A six pitch right now, but it's a twelve. And uh, how much time you got on the motor? Enough that you can start leaning on it? Well, yeah. I've I've, I've ran it. I ran it on two, uh, two or three times. You know, two days. I don't know how many. Get Boy, you got a lot down. of goop in that filter. Wow. So, I can see that without yeah. my glasses. <laughs> Man, alive, Brian. I thought you were a better craftsman than. <laughs> Well, put it up. Let's see. But, uh, I, did, I saw it flying before, you know, but I didn't the, get it. The planes are tanks, but other than How that, much does this plane weigh? 80 ounces or yeah. something? Well, it's heavy. I know that. <laughs> but even though it's a rent-a-plane, I mean, uh, yeah, I know, I know. 
but uh, okay, you want to try another flight? Plan? Yeah, it's just, yeah, put it up. Even if it's raining a little bit, what you know? Don't take the good planes out of the car. That's for sure. Well, we're definitely not taking uh, Miss Ashley out of the car here and getting her all wet. Not in this. But it looks like we're in between the raindrops, so we can get a little look at what this is—a new Merco 60, 61 or a 60? 61. And what do they call? How much do these motors cost? A hundred bucks? It cost me hundred and seventeen dollars shipped to my door. All right, one seventeen. So that was, you know, that the exchange rate at the time. So yeah, yeah. Too much, Which varies by the hour. But, uh, as we're finding out as we get ready for England. Oh, 12 o'clock. The exchange rate went up. Now it's 190. <laughs> what unbelievable! Oh, you want to go back to American money? Ah, oh, you lose 40 more dollars. What a ripoff. We're just, we're just running here. What do you want me to do? Fatten it up, point the Fatten it up, and let's just see how it runs. No, that sounds about right. Go ahead, go. go. If anything, that sounds one click too lean. That sounds about right. Right there, it sounds about right to me anyway. Let's see when he picks the nose up. He might have the tank at his shim too, who knows? Find yeah. out. I think it gets fat when it's converted. Oh, well that'll screw up anything. Look how crazy the air is, Mike. Yeah. See the wing jancing around out there? I don't know, that looks, that sounds pretty close to me. All right, it's staying lean for the whole maneuver now. Now, see if it does that in, on outside loop. See, this is the way you can tell if he needs a shim. If it doesn't do that on outside loop, Although it's, it sounds okay in level flight. If the tank shim isn't right, what'll happen? It'll 2-4 and outside's not inside. You know, you just have to shim the tank. No, it's staying lean in maneuvers on outsides too. I don't know, was he? That doesn't sound so bad. He's got the wrong prop on a plane. Maybe that prop's no good. Yeah. Look at this guy's judging Brian's pattern here, his Merc 061. Eh, a little low on the bottom. Eh, let's see, is there anything to eat here? How about a salami sandwich? Yeah, I think I'll sit in the director's chair and make a movie. Hey, why don't I come over and bite Wendy's big toe? You guys with these model planes, I don't know. Look at him, he's just checking Brian out here. <laughs> oh man, that is so cool. <laughs> ah, I think I'll go fly RC, the heck with you. Brian doesn't know he's just been judged on his last flight. Anyway, we're gonna try some different props. Whatever ballpark information we can get off of this. It certainly seems like a ballpark motor. I think it needs a prop and maybe uh, a little tuning. I'll be right up there. And while we were away at the Nats, Brian was trying some props on his Sato 56. I don't know what he's got on here now. This is a 12 610. But after the, uh, the many 56s that we saw at the Nats, a lot of different ways to set them up and get them to run good. And uh, our friend Ron Merrill has one coming. We're going to break into him, get that tuned into him. More diversity in the hobby, more neat new things, more reasons to build whatever you want to build. And don't listen to anybody. Just do what you want to do. What is this, a 13, Mike? Yeah, 13, 13. Okay, we know this works on a Tiger 60. 
So what we're gonna do is get rid of the prop, I think the prop he has on this plane. This plane is a ton, probably 85 ounces. But we're not interested in that part of it. We'd just like to see if this motor's gonna have a little bit better, a little bit better brake. And with all that pitch, it could run a little bit richer and maybe have a better 2-4 in the maneuvers. And we'll find out. We're gonna know right very soon, in between the raindrops here. Any new motor, anything new that, that we're testing, uh, we don't know where they, the manufacturer has set the compression on these. High, low, medium. He's got two gaskets in there, so what we're going to do is put on the bigger prop, take the two gaskets out, and get some idea of where this is. Uh, where. The tip-off here is an engine that isn't using an ounce of fuel a minute is also not cooling because the alcohol isn't, isn't the primary factor in cooling is the alcohol. And it's also not using the right amount of oil. Now, this, if this ran 12 minutes on six ounces of fuel, the essence is it's running 10% oil, only half the amount of oil. God, it hardly even smokes, Brian. I mean, that's a tip off, too. You don't see any smoke, and I know you got. I run it, I run it dead fat, and it just lumbers around, and it, and it runs, but it's just, you know. Well, look, we'll I try this. I want it to sound like in level flight like it is pretty much and in, you know. But in the maneuvers you want some horsepower. It goes to a two and nothing happens. It just sits there like, you know, like there's no power increase. See, my thought was it doesn't, not that it doesn't have power when it breaks, it's just that it, when it breaks it just keeps going. Yeah, and it does because you're running it lean, right. you don't have the alcohol cool in the engine and you don't have the oil cool in the engine. The, once the thing goes lean, it stays lean because it's got no oil and alcohol going through there. Well, we, we could try it both ways, and if you're right, I'll rephrase my uh, commentary. <laughs> well, I'm assuming yeah, you should know you've used them, I don't. You know, no, I never used this, this particular engine I've never had, so I'm learning just as when, when same I, as you are. My train of thought is it's, it's the same as a Tiger. It's basically a copy of a Tiger engine, yeah. Right. So that's, you know... The it shouldn't, the rules should all be pretty much the same. Correct. It should wind up with a 312, 315 Venturi and enough compression to give it a nice two cycle break, and that's it. Going the other way. And it's a Hemi head already? Did it come with a Hemi head or did Tom make it a Hemi head? Okay. Yeah, that's a copy of a big Jim Hemi, that's all that is. Okay. I don't like how this plug sits so. You want it down deeper? No, further out. It's, it's further away. Another gasket in Amy? No, no gasket. <laughs> but, well, it's already changed. I see what Tom did. That's a long plug now. Yeah, yeah. that's a thunderbolt. Okay. That's... Well, let's see. I let's got... see. The only way you're gonna learn. I, I put four-stroke plug in here to make it run the other day too. Because Does it work okay with a four-stroke yeah, plug? It didn't work. It didn't really work. The only thing that worked was a Fox Gold plug with that day. Yeah. I had it in today, mm. and it seems when, as soon as you take the Gold plug off of it, you notice the RPMs drop. It just could be a little hotter, so I went to this. But that could be part of the surgeon, too, if it's really too hot. But what it's telling you, the compression is so low that it, it doesn't have enough compression to keep the heat, keep the fire going. Now, I can run this without any gaskets? Sure. All right, we're going to try this with the higher compression, the, the 13.6 prop. Actually, this this is a Cardinal kit too. He's gonna, uh, I hope, make a British version of this so we can call it the Das Merco, <laughs> Das Gobbleschwanz over here. Hey, at least we're getting some flying here instead of hanging out and drinking beer. <laughs> Brian's ruler. This ruler is. I wouldn't say how how old do you think this ruler is, Brian? This used to be my ruler when I started the hobby in the, in the fifties. Yeah, oh my God, this thing came apart. It exploded one day on the field. I got so mad I kicked it in the woods. Brian rescued it, duct taped it all up. It works like a, works like a jewel. That's the way you gave it to me. <laughs> when you have a, a plane that's been repaired and it's real heavy, this is really, this is over 80 ounces. This is a candidate for just what we were talking about earlier on in the video, maybe a quarter inch extension on each flap. It, and he's already got everything taped. And so what happens, you still have a functional plane instead of, or if you don't need it, or if your skill level is high enough that you don't need this, well, you can always find somebody that will use it to test motors in or to test props or to, to just have a fun plane for rainy days like we're having right now. And you don't want to take that good plane and get it all soaking wet. What's different about the Merco? What would you say, it's eight millimeters? Eight millimeter thread. Oh my God, that's why that engine's announced. Look at the size of the nut. 
They made this. What were they thinking? They made this out of aluminum. You know, you just could make this nut out of aluminum. You'd save an ounce on the engine. Yeah. Holy mackerel. So these are the little things that, uh, you know, having that big crankshaft, it's definitely heavy, too. That's that's why that engine's a little heavier than a Tiger. Sure, once you commit to the prop. Yeah, oh yeah, you're married to the prop. You mean I can't have my prop back? Oh, well, you can have it. <laughs> For a price. I could have it, but what am I going to do with it? Mike, you could use these to put the nut, the, the wheels on a car. The needle that's going to use more fuel with that tire compression. Stretching it up, stretching it up. I didn't want them to get a real lean run, especially when you're trying that. Now, we don't know if this mode is going to turn a 13-inch prop. A Tiger 60 usually will. We'll find out. Again, lean it out a little bit. Better a little rich than a little lean. Okay, so what Brian's going to try now is putting one head gasket in at a time to try to marry the power up to this prop. So we're going to be getting a go soon because we have a little little family cookout today and uh oh that sounds good sounds like Roy's gonna whack a plane over there maybe get up on time for the family cookout here it's not even an hour later and woodchuck man is back you know what we ought to do Mike we ought to find out where he lives and capture woodchucks from the field and bring them to his property let him eat all his vegetables oh man woodchuck man is releasing more wood we're gonna have a woodchuck problem here pretty soon He's looking guilty. He says, oh, I don't know. I don't know if these guys are going to... Put them in the trunk so we can, they can't find their way back. Yeah, right. <laughs> we ought to catch him and bring him back to his house. Follow him home. Find out where he lives. Put thousands of woodchucks on his property. Oh, God. And he was here before I even got here? Yo! Yo! Vince Woodchuck, man, he's got to bring them to the back of the property now instead of releasing them. So he goes, by the road, they get run over. So Woodchuck, man's going to bring them, with the assistance of Mike. <laughs> Mike the Woodchuck, man. Show them how to release a Woodchuck, Mike. Chickadooly would be so proud of Mike. Well, honey, look, we could release these Woodchucks. So he was here three times today releasing. With the, does he have a job? A family? Anything to do with his life except catch woodchucks. This ought to be funny. Mike's going to go over and give him a hot time. <laughs> oh, man. How much wood would a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck... Now, look at the action here. This, this all Nowhere else on Earth do you have crazy stuff like this happening. How much wood would a woodchuck chuck? Actually, while we are flying here, though, we, we do enjoy the We have deer that come in and out of here. We have snapping turtles. We've had plenty of woodchucks and geese over the years, although it doesn't look like the geese are as much of a problem this year. And we have all these wild birds that come out of these chickadoolies. There right? we go. There we go. Go on, just reach in with your bare hand. What's the problem? Look at these little guys go. Just a big they're not woodchucks. They're squirrels. He's catching squirrels. Unbelievable. 
Unbelievable. You got enough charge to fly it? No. No. Charge? Yes, I was down by Sergio's club. They had hundreds of them down there. It was unbelievable. Some days when you come home from the flying field, you're kind of depressed because you wanted to stay at the flying field. Not today. Check it out. Oh, my son has the grill going, baby. Oh, yeah. Look at those ribs. All right, grill man. This way, in case in case uh, my business ever goes bankrupt, we'll just open up a restaurant. Yeah, the, the barbecue, mm. Wendy's barbecue. Wendy's barbecue pit. Mm mm mm. Karen's little business making birdhouses is prospering. We have about half of the people in our neighborhood that have one already. Of course, we're sick of looking at them, but Karen is very creative with her little, her little birdhouses. In fact, there's one behind the table. How many of these things do we have? Anyway, one day next week, we're going to get a day of running the B-25 in. We're certainly not going to do it today. It's a family day, but we're getting ready. We're coming up on that time when it's going to be time to test the B-25. And I can't wait. We waited a whole year for this time, and it's not far away. Official Windy video. You have to tell us your name. What's your name? I'm Rob Kastner. Okay, and tell us about the award you won with this plane. Well, I entered a 4-H fair for, for, for my plane, and, and I won Best in Show. Now, this is a plane that you built as a part of the group of, I, I know there's a group of guys in the role building uh, planes. Yeah, I built this as a 4-H as a club called the Flying Wildcats. Okay. And I entered this at the Morris County 4-H fair. Okay. See the ribbon a little? Okay. And you're the winner, obviously, or yes. you wouldn't have the ribbon. <laughs> Now, you built most of it yourself. Yes. Who helped you, Carl? Um, oh, my father. Okay. Carl. Roy. Okay, Roy Ward's involved in that, Ward, too? Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, I think Alan Mary also helped. Oh, Alan Mary helped everybody. Yeah. Now, are you going to fly it today? Um, are you going to put it up for a flight? I'm not sure, because this plane, this plane hasn't flown yet. Well, that never stopped me. It's got to fly sometime. Yeah. It's like jumping in a swimming pool on a hot day. Sometimes you just have to jump. Yeah. All right, I, I might fly today. Well, I'm going to stick around for a little while, but uh, we hope, hey, I hope you're going to be uh, enjoying a hobby for a long time. See, we don't call it a hobby. We call it a sport. So we're all trying to get in the habit. It is a sport, too. Whenever you mention it to your friends, tell them it's a sport. Ah, we got more people coming in here. Okay, good luck. Cool. How many kids do you anticipate having out here today? Two. Two? Okay. It was difficult to get the two. Well, we'll you get know, some vacation. video of them flying. I'll give them a copy, and uh, I'm sure they'll, they'll appreciate that. Windy they videoed us. Cablevision videoed me on Friday doing a learn to fly. Great. At the fair, and they yeah. were in the middle of the circle with us. All right. Send them to my house if they want pro, you know, pro stuff. Sure. Cool. Isn't that great? The snake man. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. That's a nice, that's a 3 oh, megapixel. That's beautiful. It's 3 wow. megapixels. Thank you, sir. You're welcome, Captain. Oh, I think he'll be there tomorrow. Make sure yeah. he sees it. That's a great yeah. shot, isn't it? Yep. Just watching this morning. Oh, Did you guys make it out okay? They it started to rain and stuff. Great picture. Oh. It's a, uh, oh, she's not a snake fan. Oh. <laughs> Just made her day. <laughs> to fill in the details, this is Call Holsworth, who got us on the front page of the paper recently with a nice article he has and I'm gonna I'm gonna hope I'm right on a number between 17 and 19 young children that have all been part of the 4-H club and built their own model with the help of dad and possibly uh, some of the circle burners call Alan Mary Tom Hampshire now a couple of them are rolling in here now they're gonna have a little fun fly day teaching the kids how to fly 
and my part of this is just to come out and enjoy a nice relaxing day with them. Um, shoot a little video and give them a copy so they can they can basically uh, just enjoy being around model planes, get a little taste of what it's like being around planes, the smell of the oil, and we got some parents here, and we have a photographer from, looks like somebody that knows how to shoot pictures or just has an expensive camera, we're not sure which. Just one of the many ways our club tries to uh, help promote the sport, get some new people involved. Trainers and some planes that are capable of doing maneuvers. So we should this to be a great fun day. Introducing some new faces to the world of control line, the sport of model aviation. I'm sure the kids are going to be ready for the combat job, but they've got a couple of them out here just in case. I guess some of these kids, I'm not sure, one of them said he's already soloed out and one is ready to solo. Always a lot of fun. Now it's hard not to mention some of the people, Paul Holdsworth, Alan Mary, people that I know, Roy Ward, Tom Hampshire, have all put a lot of time and energy into this program. And our congratulations again, even though on the Circle Burn and Meat video, we did not get Al's winning flight. He was the winner of the Red Reinhardt Cup, flying his Cardinal. And we're gonna try to get a day later this week. They're predicting five days of really hot weather. We're gonna try to get a couple of, if we can see the air is just bumpy. Not appropriate for doing the testing we wanna do with our control system. But I'm sure we'll have an enjoyable day out here with the 4-H kids. And they did get a nice picture in the newspaper. In fact, it was on the front page of the paper. Good publicity for the sport of model aviation. Next up on our little fun fly day is going to be Mary Knight flying her buster and they're going to try to get some pictures from inside the circle for the, uh, the newspaper. The reporter that's here is going to try to stand out in the middle of the circle so we'll see how this works out. I've tried doing this several times and it's really awkward. It's almost like team racing in reverse here. So we'll see if this woman is able to get some good shots. She's going to take some, I think, some pictures for the newspaper, but and of course we're looking forward to trying to get some publicity for the sport, so, and possibly bring in some new kids to the club. You're gone, yeah. That's what they said here, and especially later on in the contest. This, is, this may look real easy to do if you're the photographer. Trust me, this is difficult. And it's even more difficult shooting video. I remember we were doing the Z-Tron videos and I was trying to shoot Mike flying a plane. It was, it was an adventure. But the idea is to give the kids a little show that what are some of the possibilities in the world of control line. And one of the club members even brought out his twin-engine bomber. Just what I need to make me crazy as I wait to get that B-25 going. Al's got one of the trainer planes out for one of the new recruits.
Hey Al, who's that neutral on that handle? The guy's got about 30 degrees up, so keep it level. Or is that just to give him a little challenge? Make it exciting for him. <laughs> All right, one graduate of the 4-H program. Now, since this young man has not soloed out yet, Mary's going to give him a little hand. Try to get him to solo out a little bit during this flight. The thing that's happening with this 4-H program is, is something you wish it would happen all over the country hundreds and hundreds of times so that a lot of these young people would just be exposed to the sport of model aviation and get to feel it and see it and touch it and smell it and just be part of it. We're getting some good newspaper publicity out of this too, by the way. We've, we've, like I said, we've been in our paper, and I see they're in, there's another paper there, and I didn't get a chance to shoot the headline, but they're getting some good publicity. And it goes dead lean, oh no. <laughs> this is not exactly what they had in mind. I think they were looking for a more of a rich run. Murray's trying to shake the plane, get the engine to calm down, slow down a bit. Got a little Sado in here, Al? Yeah, that's the one I got from you. Oh, okay. Got his little fuel pickup inside the cowl. Kind of neat. Are you are you uh, out to compete with Augie in this Cub War or whatever you guys are having? Augie was, Augie was in love with this little thing. This is, I like this better than his. Don't tell him I said so. <laughs> this is not a, <laughs> you bet. This is not a Piper, you know. It's a... Taranka, right. Primer? No, Alpha flying. When my father was alive, this was one of the last planes he owned, was an Aranka on floats. Oh, really? Yeah. Sam Bellied really liked this plane, too. He likes these kind of... Pretty airplane. Oh yeah, cute. Will it loop? I don't know. Did you try looping it yet? Uh, I had a weak prop on here. This is a different prop. I'm to... And so difficult to start.
Oh, they got a nice realistic sound, too. Mike Cooper's here helping out with the festivities. Gonna fly a demonstration flight for the kids. And it looks like the weatherman's really come, really, really contributing a nice warm, breezy, but not too windy day. Rick's going for his next flying lesson with Al. What a great day. What a great to see some new kids, new faces. And some fun club activity based uh, based on hopefully exposing these kids to something they may never have seen in school. adjustment to the needle valve here.
Uh oh, I think we may have to fire the mechanic here. Up is our superstar. Oh, uh oh, Al. Sounds like he stuck his finger in a prop. Now, this is his own plane. This is not the club trainer. That's the, uh, that he built that plane himself? Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, yours. I know it was yours. Yeah. All right. All right, so what Al's doing is just testing the plane to make sure the handle's set and that it flies level and stuff. All right, he's up. Now this is his plane, not the club trainer. This young man is going to be a star of the future. He's doing really good. I'm impressed. Now, we really had a great day up with the kids in the 4-H club, Call and all the people from the club, Al and Mary. But we have work to do in the shop. It's them, it's making up a real sophisticated break-in stand, but we have had motors to break in all summer. We've had real good luck breaking in some of the bar stocks for Les Demet. And today we have a 56 for Ron Merrill that we're going to break in. Now, just today, Paul Walker purchased the 72 and I'm not so sure if he's going to build a new plane or if he's going to try that out in a Mustang. We'll look forward to hearing that. Anyway, when you get a brand new Sato, there's a couple of things I've learned, and I'm publishing them in Stunt News for anybody who really doesn't follow the videos. And, and uh, Things we've learned the easy way, the hard way. You get a new Sato, breaking it in is a critical thing. You really, one of the things you don't want to do is put a Venturi on it and then go run it. You really want to break it in with the carburetor in place. And of course all the Sados come with their own unique tools. And what we do is we break them in for customers, set the carburetor to get a reasonably nice idle. So pretty much the deal is that it would be a turnkey operation when it's done. And check the valves, make sure that they're still within the lash that they pull for. We have a specific break-in prop, and we know an RPM that we like to run the motors at. Boy, when these come, they are really jewelry. They're really, they're really exceptionally nice. Think about this break-in operation, and Les, like I said, is making up a real pro setup. We only use this as a temporary stopgap until we have Les's setup, which I hope is going to be real soon. Anybody that, that has never seen the JET system, the break-in system, it's all 
solid billet. It's really a work of art. Anyway, that's how quick we can get the motors in and out, and that's what makes this setup real good. We have a nice 32 ounce tank. So for the four stroke, usually one and a half, two tanks of that fuel, and they're ready to go. As soon as that oil comes out clean, they're ready to go. One of the things I found that, that really work well, at least for us, so far, virtually all the engines we've broken in with the carburetor, getting them, the Sato recommends under 4,000 RPM, and that's what we try to do. If you have a Venturi already in place, that can be a problem, unless you run it so rich. In fact, I, I've never been able to run it rich enough, and you really don't want to run it that rich. So if you have a brand new Sato, and you don't want the dealer or myself to break it in for you, well, the choice is pretty much we have this little break-in stand with a little adjuster that we can control a throttle throw. And that gives us a throttle adjustment as we're working on it. This has been a really good setup so far. And what we try to do is when the customer is ready for the engine, there's a couple little things, like for instance, the back of the washer that comes with the engine is smooth. I like to put some knurls on that. Now what this does, it's an ordinary engraving tool, $10 tool. It allows the prop to get a better bite. And since four strokes tend to backfire every once in a while, you want that to be as, as knurled as possible. Things that I've found is a good test of how these motors break in. First off, you don't want to run them wide open. You don't want to run them like a two stroke. You don't need a two for them or any of that nonsense. What you need to do is check the oil. Now we mix our break-in fuel with a little bit of extra oil. Just a tad extra oil. You want to get this the little overflow here. And then I want to monitor with a paper towel the oil that's coming out of here. It's going to come out black when it starts because all the parts are wearing in. But then eventually it's going to come out cleaner and cleaner and cleaner. And at some point in time, heck we can just lay that back there for right now. We also want to have a way of controlling the throttle. Because we want to keep the RPM under 4,000 for the first roughly for an hour. And what we can do here is we just get it, because this is nice and quiet, we could run this right in our backyard. We don't need to even go to the field today. We could run this right here. But this is, I really suggest anybody's going to break it in. If you're going to use a Venturi, break it in. And there's an article going to be in Stunt News real soon with what I learned. Get it broken in. Make sure the prop is tight and the, the washer is knurled and run it until the oil comes out perfectly clean. And that's usually an hour and a half, an hour, depending, each motor is just a little bit different. Over the last two years of breaking in these engines, there's certainly some things we found and it's that first hour or so that's real critical. You don't want the engine to go over 4,000 RPM. See already the oil is coming out of here. Well that is just about as sweet as it gets. When this one's all run in and the oil is coming out perfectly clean, that oil is going to come out clean. It's going to take some time. Now the nice thing is while this is running, we can be doing other things. We just keep an eye on it and make sure it come over with the tack every once in a while, make sure the RPM isn't going up over 4,000.
it's going to come out of there a lot clearer once those parts are worn in. Now we still want to get some flights before the year's out, some more flights on our Typhoon. One thing nice about having an old Air Force full of planes, we have some of everything. We have some of the pipe planes, some of the Tiger 60 ships, some of the four strokes, and that's what really keeps our interest high all through the year, just having new stuff all the time. Now what we didn't check in this, and I'm sure it's one of the things Paul's going to be trying soon, we never ran a 56 in this plane, and that would bring the weight down to under 60 ounces if we had a 56 instead of it. We have a 72, it gets the weight to about 63 ounces. And with the carbon tank, it's probably down about 62. So this should be a lot of fun once we get our concrete field back. But again, the primary focus, and we're gonna be starting real soon, soon as I can get less Demet over here for a day. We're gonna do some more bench running on the engines and get the carbs fine tuned. Cause we're only weeks away from being able to fly this. And I guess if anybody's wondering, there is no way I'm gonna fly this plane on Circle burn a field on the grass. We want to wait for the field at Palisade Park to give it every possible opportunity to uh, be able to use the Z-Tron and the things that we actually built the plane for, all the features, the rollout, the takeoff, the landing, whatever, and of course, hopefully, a stunt pattern. I saw Al Knight earlier in this video, and this is a shot of Al he had won the Red Reinhardt Cup, a very prestigious award, and at least in our opinion, my opinion, something every club member uh, aspires to. Anyway, he has had nothing but the best of luck. This is a stock Cardinal kit. It's monocoated. And Al has just had, for an advanced level flyer, this has really helped him move up the ladder quickly. And I think he's going to be writing a little report for Stunt News, so that should be a lot of fun. Now, after two tanks of fuel, ooh, that feels nice. This is the main thing, as you can see, and I'll scoop the oil up. The oil that's coming out of here, clean as a whistle. Now, what I usually do, I just leave this on the rich side, so that when whoever's gonna run this, it'll be rich, it'll probably go in two or three clicks. Ooh, that's got, that is nice now. Boy, that's about as good as it gets. And boy, seeing how nice Paul Walker's engine ran at the Nats, I hope Ron's going to have real good luck with this. Now, one of the things I wanted to do, as long as we're breaking in engines and I'm all greased up, I had shimmed this tank four or five times already to get it the way I wanted it. This, of course, is the Laser 70. It's a relatively heavy engine, but we had some real nice runs the last time we flew it. And we're going to try to get a day of testing in at the field. I made some props for it. This runs at a, a little bit lower RPM than the Sato. This sets in a plane is a little unusual in terms of where the muffler exits and having a tank shim way up. And we only have a couple of days of fly on this, but it really did show a lot of promise. And while we have some, uh, some downtime in between, we're waiting for our 65 Rojet. I figured we'd get a couple of days of flying this in. Very unusual engine. This was donated to us by Elliot Scott, and we have we basically got about a gallon, gallon and a half of fuel through it, but not really pushed it to the limit so far. Not really fine-tuned props, not really, and I hope we have the tank shim finalized now for once.
Now what I did, I replaced the plug. I think that plug was too cold for the engine. What I did, I put in a Thunderbolt Long RC. And the last thing I'll do is I'll put in a four cycle, an OS Max, if, and I want to get this, that it runs a little smoother and a little hotter. I think the plug in this engine, the day we were testing this, I think the plug was too cold. It just seemed to be running rough. Well, we got two ships ready for the test day, and all we're waiting for is some decent weather here. Have a little fun with the four strokes, have a little fun with the two strokes. We'll just have a lot of fun, period. It's going to be Middlesex contest is coming up Sunday, and we'll see which one of these guys we feel like flying. Now looking back all, all the way to 1987, it's hard to believe we've had so many different motors in the old tradition. Anyway, wanted to, in the last couple of days we've put some some good data into our database and I wanted to go over it with a little bit of a storyboard. Now after several days at the flying field and bench running and test running, we've come to absolutely one conclusion that's different than a Sato is the tank shim and I want to go over how how this evolved. This of course is the engine, pardon my artwork. The laser is the only engine that we've tested that has the carburetor itself attached right to the head and I'm trying to make a center line here. And what that meant was when we set this up, now if you were running this in an RC scale plane it wouldn't even matter but you could put the tank in various places and that's what this engine is made for but we found out absolutely positively and after doing this back and forth and shimming it too far in each direction, the center of that carburetor where the needle valve is seems like it wants to be right on the tank center line. Now unlike the Sato, the Sato has, I'm just making this for a reference point so you can get some idea, the carburetor would be here. Now, especially to 72, where we have really hundreds of flights, that center line, now it may be that, that the shim is off a 64th one way or another, but what happens with a laser, it seems like, and this is valuable data that we put into our database, it seems like where the carburetor is on the engine, that's where the tank wants to be centered. In other words, it seems like, at least for all the purposes and all the testing we've done, We've kind of we've kind of settled in on this. Now one of the ways I Brian Manow found a way that I, I'm not sure I totally agree with this, but it seemed to work. It worked pretty well on his four-stroke Sato 56. Is he measured up where the carburetor was, made a tank shim, got this right in line as a starting point, and then what he did, he set the engine to various speeds, and I think in his case it was 9,500. So we're just going to man it. The speed is not relevant because it would relate to the prop. But then what he did, he held up, had the plane there, tacked it, took the plane and turned it over, tacked it, and just kept shimming the plane without ever even flying it, just to get it roughly the same both ways. Now that's really a crude way to do it, and it doesn't take into account the amount of yaw that the rudder would put into this that it, at various places in the pattern, especially with a raby rudder this may not be exactly what you want. It's better to do it in flight, but what this does, what's real nice about doing it that way is it gives you a real good starting point. You don't get the first flight, flip the plane over on its back and the motor shuts off, or it goes dead lean. So those are two things, two little pieces of data that I feel it's worth passing on now to the people that are aggressively pursuing four strokes. We still have the four stroke in our Typhoon, of course, but the problem is we have too many planes to fly. We have our new Jet 65 bar stock coming, and we really, number one priority is to get that B-25 in the air in the next month. So we've got a lot of things to work on. This is good data you can put right in the database. Now you saw earlier in the video we were at the field, actually been at the field several days. Some days I haven't even brought the camera, but Brian has purchased a Merco 61. This is the new version. And he's learned a couple of things right away that we can pass on to you if you've got any desire to 
try a Merco 61. The first, the first problem that he had was the fuel consumption was very, very low. Now when I say that, and I'm using his numbers, he was using three ounces of fuel and it was running 12 minutes when he got the engine after he broke it in. Now, for anybody who doesn't know, and you always have people, oh, wow, my, my max FP or my this or that or that or whatever, it only uses one ounce of fuel an hour. Well, there's a problem with that. And almost anybody that knows anything about engines is gonna tell you what'll happen if you're running three ounces. This means that you're running, just to make a rough number up, you're running four minutes per ounce. Now forget every other factor. Right off the bat, the first day Brian was out with the plane, and we weren't there with the camera that day. The first day, as the motor was shipped, he was running f four minutes an ounce, and I, I pretty much told him that what's going to happen is you're only running, I like to use one minute per ounce as a good guideline. Now this assumes you have 22% oil, power master fuel. So what happens is you really have, in this case, it's like running 5% oil. That's exactly, you've got a fourth of the amount of oil, maybe even less, because as you get the mixture leaner and leaner and leaner, what's going to happen? The motor runs hotter and hotter and hotter. So there's a golden rule that I've come to respect, that when I start tuning a motor, I'd like to start at the one ounce a minute range. In other words, a six ounce tank, a pattern takes five and a half minutes, 10 laps after the pattern. So what Brian did, he had Tom Hampshire drill out, and I think he have drilled out the Venturi. So that was step two. The Venturi, I don't know what size it was, but he wound up making it 312. And now it came out to be in, that he was running about eight minutes on three ounces. So it was a significant improvement, but still not right. Now the next step, and we haven't finished this yet, but we'll try to report in on it. He was shimming the head up, shimming the head down. As you shim the head up, as you add head shims, the mileage, it uses less and less fuel. So my thought was he should take the head, Tom Hampshire can take it, and mill 20 thousandths off the bottom of the head. 20 thousandths is roughly the thickness of a typical Tiger head gasket, 20 to 24 thousandths. Because what we're trying to do, or what Brian is trying to do, is get the motor to use an ounce of fuel a minute. Now, it may seem like this is kind of basic, but this really is when the, the first off the motor was making nice power. It's an inexpensive motor. It's about a hundred bucks, a little over a hundred bucks. It seemed to two four real nice. It seemed to be willing to turn a 12 and a half, 12 and three quarter inch prop. It got soft on a 13 inch prop, I think because the compression was too low and we were really in a couple of hot days there. So. This is, the, this is what we've learned about the Merco so far. And there's going to be a lot of people that this motor, once it's tuned to use an ounce of fuel a minute, I think it's going to be an acceptable motor and it's going to have a real nice place in the hobby for retrofitting planes or for people building planes around it. Again, if you get a motor with a little tiny Venturi and real low compression and it's, it's running forever on fuel, you want, you want to get it down to where it's using, I think, a good starting point is an ounce a minute. And that lets you know that enough alcohol is going through the motor, cooling it. A lot of people think the air cools a motor. I think the number I've read over and over again is about 85% of the cooling that gets done on a motor gets done by the alcohol and the fuel. And probably... 15% by the head fins, but, but still, if you're not putting enough alcohol through, you're not putting enough coolant through. The oil acts as a coolant. The oil pulls heat, especially the castor oil. But if you, if you decide you like to try one of these motors, my suggestion would be don't even fool with it until you get a big Venturi in there and get the compression up to where it's using about an ounce a minute. You can even check that on the bench. And get it in a ballpark before you even put it in the plane. And that should be able to save everybody just a little bit of time and energy. And I think that motor is going to have a good future once it's fine-tuned.
Now, over the past few years, my interest in the hobby is certainly geared toward building new, unusual, maybe ships that are just a little different, warbirds, twins, zetrons, typhoons, whatever. I, I really do like to compete, and hey, let's be honest, I'd love to go win the Nats 15 times in a row or something and be a hero, but there's a reality to it, and I think it's something we all have to accept. We're all getting older. Our energy levels aren't what they used to be. And the new guys in the event, the younger guys, let's be honest, one by one, they're going to take our place. And sometimes when you look at that, you can be saying, oh, gee, that's terrible. Oh, it really isn't. But there's one thing that stays the same in his hobby for me no matter what. And I shouldn't say hobby, I promised John Brodeck I'd say sport. And that is coming up with new and different planes every year. And that's the part of the, the sport that I really enjoy the most. I enjoy videotaping all this and sharing it and hearing about other people's, the things they have, they wanna do. Joe Adamusco's biplane project other things that Dan Banjock's working on, I think they're just incredible. But I had one thing that I wanted, you know, before, before we get to the end of this video, one thing that we were talking about at the field, and on the way home I thought about it and I said, gee, that sounds like something that would appeal to me. Now the problem is time, you know, if we, if we well, first off, if you didn't have to work, if you could be really retired, I, I, well, that certainly would change things, but being like fake retired like I am, where you're retired but you work more hours than if you work, well, I still do something I love so I shouldn't say anything, but one of the things, and I just want to share this with everybody that's been around and been on my, my video list for so long, there will be a time real soon, and it's probably two to three years away when Karen will be totally retired, and I'll probably then at that point in time look at maybe being a little more retired than I am now. And I'm always looking for new projects, new exciting things that not many people have done or that nobody's done. I wanted a couple of years ago to try to work on the development of an all carbon fiber plane. Certainly, I would say it's safe to say that this wing performs at a level that uh, is totally competitive, even though sometimes I'm not. I don't see a whole lot about the wing other than finding the material that we're ultimately looking for, and that is the two ounce carbon. If we ever find that, we will certainly be moving forward on that part of the project. We know we can make carbon fiber fuselages, and we know they work, last, hold up well in service. And as we come up on a time for flying the B-25, I mean, there's just so many things. So many ideas I have for next year's building season, but one idea has really caught my mind. And I want to go with, I just, just want to get some feedback from people, seeing if this is something they might think would be interesting. And we were hashing this out at the Circle Burner Field the other day, and it, it really didn't catch my, pique my interest at the time. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought about it, this might be something that'd be fun to do one winter. Now, where this this project gets its, I guess, I guess the basis of it is to build two relatively identical planes, and a, one based on the Rojet 65, which we we should have shortly, and one based on the Barstock the Barstock 40, which is a much smaller engine. This is based on the 35 case. So what I had thought about doing was, is designing up, and just for lack of something better, we'll, we'll just make whatever this sketch would be, making up one of our, kind of a traditional ship, in the typical sizes that we all know work, 700 to 725 square inches, roughly in that area using all proven components that we already knew work. Roughly a 62 inch span. And then downsizing the plane 
So it pretty much would look exactly like the original one, except be just a tad smaller. And I'm not so sure how much that dimension, this is where I would, I would kind of want to run this by some of the people, Dave Downey for one, Bill Nett's band for another one, and I would be thinking this plane should be about 650 inches, have maybe a 58 inch span, 57, 58 inch span, but because, here's the reason this all becomes practical. First off, having the Rojet engines, we know they're going to work. We know they're going to be dead reliable, and we know that's probably what we're going to base our competition planes around in the future. If they're not four-strokes, the four-stroke ones will be based around Sados, especially if they're semi-scale planes. But for all purposes here, what would be neat about this kind of a Gemini project would be to build two almost identical planes. Now, the neat thing here is you would probably try to get this one to come in around 62 ounces. This one maybe, uh, I don't know, 55. So you would have two ships that very similar, but in two different size brackets, and be able to compare them. Now, if we go ahead with this project, and there's no saying we will or won't, it's just one of the other things that's on the table for next year. The Gemini project, it looks like what would make this possible is Dave Downey having the ability with his CAD cam to make things enlarged and shrink down infinitely. And we could give Dave numbers for this plane, draw up a rough set of plans and have him downsize it to this size plan. Now I just think this shows a lot of interest. And if we were going to build two planes in the same year, one of the, one of the things we'd want to consider here is, is to keep the construction to a minimum, possibly using foam wings in both of them, making them as relatively simple to build as possible, not making them complex like the B-25, possibly just making them that, that they would be quick and easy to build, and that would have a very good effect on getting both of them to be very similar in the way they're built, maybe the way they'll even fly. But it's something that I've never done yet, and that in itself has some appeal to me. But it may be something that the more I think about it, the more it's going to appeal to me. And that remains to be seen, of course, in the future. Just as one more choice to a year that it looks like we're going to have a lot of choices. And where it's all going to shake and bake out, only time is going to tell, and when we get back from England, that's going to be the point in time when we're going to want to start cutting balsa wood or laying up carbon or whatever. And that just, that's the part of the, the sport that appeals to me. Just building the same plane over and over and over and over. Yes, you'd be more competitive, I'm sure. But it just wouldn't be as much for drill. We'll do it with the drill. We want to know where we're starting from now. All right, tell everybody your name. You're back in a hobby. He's back addicted <laughs> I'm, I'm, to drugs. <laughs> I'm back in a hobby after 50 years. And, okay. Uh, yeah, I originally was in it, I was, uh, I flew stunt and everything else, but in 50 years, things have changed tremendously. I yeah, I've gotten say. old is what's happened. Yeah, I, I you haven't, but, <laughs> and your name is John? My name is John Pickett. Okay. I'm a part of the Circle Burners Club. Oh man, that's the worst club out of, <laughs> guys, they're all drunks. Anyway, let's see what you got. He's got some cool stuff. This Looks is like an got... original. I built it mainly to try out uh, a few different things that I wanted to try for some time. One was the stabilator controls. Okay. Okay, the other thing, if you notice, on the top here is is a trim aileron. And okay. on the lower side, underneath, is another trim aileron. What these are supposed to do for me, they move about two degrees is when the plane goes through maneuvers, this one goes up. In other words, when you give it up control, this okay. one goes up and keeps like a two degree pitch, almost the same as having rudder control. Okay. It'll make the plane pull to the outside. If you look underneath, here's the other one. Oh, okay. If you okay. give down control, this will- And they're interconnected with the controls? They're interconnected with the controls. They only work when the gear comes up. The gear I have locked down because okay. I was in a mode to try to check this thing out up okay. to these two points and the gear. But I'm having problems with 
over controlling and it causing me to stall out. Now I brought the thing to Wendy. Well, we, I can tell you why you're having trouble because the pivot point here is too far back. Is it? Yeah, the pivot point needs to be way far forward of that. that That's an easy cure. I mean, I, we know what the problem is going to be right off the bat. That's not going to be a hard one to figure out. The, the pivot point where this pivots, if it's up here, it'll be very self, it'll be like the wheel of a shopping cart. As you, if you put it back here, you'd never be able to fly the plane. Do you know what I'm saying? There's a point, yeah. I think the given point on this, and you could, you could ask Bill Metzband would be the one to know. We could email him right now, in fact. This is probably like, I'm gonna guess 15%. Because you want more behind it than in front of it. As this deflects, hold your hand out the car window and, and you'll see what I mean. Move your, around your middle finger, it'll, It'll be very hard to fly level. That'll be the problem. Okay, one of the things, uh, let me explain why it was done the way it, it was done. Okay, I wasn't aware of, of the, yeah. the pivot point being important to being here. My... Uh, 182, um, give or take. What okay. I was looking for was, in other words, normally when you look at an elevator movement, right. You normally try to get anywhere from somewhere around 30, 35 degrees on the elevator, okay? By me doing this, I was pick up and picking up an additional 30 degrees, which would give me mm. 30 and 30, which would give me 60. You need which to move I it a lot less. It's too much now. Oh yeah, yeah. You need so to I move that about five degrees. Down. Right. Right. That would be that would be, in other words, slowing that motion down would be step one if you couldn't change the pivot point. That would help. I noticed because one of the things is once you get it in the air, right, you have no problem until you start giving it control. Once you start giving right. it control, right, it gets unstable. It gets, right, it just goes crazy. Mm. It wants to do its own thing. And, and you got the side exhaust jet, which we're just miking up to see what Venturi side he had. And the head is already shimmed on that? Looks like the head already has some shims in it. We're just comparing it with Les's. Well, it is definitely the low time motor though. Oh, okay. Is that good or bad? No, good. It's bad. Oh, it's definitely good. When you, how, how long have you had? A raptor. I think you should make a bird a plane called the Oriole. <laughs> hey, raptor. Anyway, I think it's only going to be a matter of time and John is going to be, uh, be building a cardinal. I think this was the funniest, thing, the funniest thing on all Nats thing. We caught this kid fishing in the net, at the Nats in the uh, the pond, and made him throw the fish back. I don't know if that really was that funny after all. I don't know, Chicka Dooley. I don't know whether I should trust this bird or not. He, he does not approve of the raptor. He wants cardinals. We have a, little, a, a project I thought I'd share with the people. Of course, whenever you have a tune pipe and there's baffles in here, well, there's always a possibility. I think this is an old Brian Ether prop. It, uh, it was sent to me by Kim Forster. And I'm just... I, what he did, he bought one of my pipes, and I thought I'd try to fix this for him so he'd have a spare, but you can hear it's it's a problem. Now, what I did, I tried to look inside with a... Shush! I'll... I'm trying to look in there and see. It's the first baffle. It's totally loose. Now, it's really difficult when, when a pipe is made to bond anything aluminum to anything composite. This is just one example of what can happen. Let's see where that piece is. If we can see it, we may have a chance of working it loose. Anyway, you can hear it. So the cost of, doesn't matter what pipe you, you buy, pipes are always subject to. Now see, you can see another thing, the way the resin is cured, back here is where the baffle is. This is where it is a hot spot. The resin has already changed color. Same as it changes up here because this is where they typically get hotter than normal. And back here where the baffle is. So it's probably telling you that the baffle is pretty restrictive. I can look in there. But of course at, at the price pipes 
pipes are, it pays to try to fix this, and that's what I'm going to try to do for Kim. I'm trying to look in there and see where exactly where that baffle is laying and why it's broken. Let's see if you can see that up there. I'm not sure you can really see this. Okay, now, now you can see it. Okay, there it is. It's just floating around in there. It's totally come apart. I've got a grip on it, except I can't see from this angle. I've been, I'm going to have to get my... What I'll try to do is shine a light in the other end, and I can see. See, now I'm holding it. And I wonder, it looks like it's the tube that... I can't really tell. Yeah, it's, a, it's the tube. So now there could be a way if we can get this out. I doubt if we can. I'm not real confident we're going to be able to get this out. If I could squeeze it down. Now after chewing away at this for about an hour, I realized that part is not coming out until I grind this piece off. So I'm going to have to make another tail piece for this, which is not really a big problem. But this is, well, this is the baffle. The, the tube that interconnected the baffles. And you can see it was broken. It's broken on one side or not the other, I'm not sure. But to get it out, now we have, I want to roughen this back piece up with some rough sandpaper and make a, make a back piece for this. Any kind of a good composite bond, you need to get 80 grit sandpaper. And in this case, I got some M600. I want to roughen this whole area up. Without, without roughening it up, no matter what you do to bond this, it's not going to stick. That bond, again, I want to get a, a good bite into the old epoxy. Now I have to see if I can make a little part, or one that I already have, from one of the molds I already have. parts that I used and molded to make the baffles and the back ends of the, the custom pipes I make. So what I need to do here, roughen up where the joint is going to be, roughen it up inside of course, and then get the hole diameter to what we want to use as the replacement hole diameter for this pipe. The idea again is to get it rough on the inside as well as the outside. Seemed like this cutter worked the best. I tried a couple different cutters here to get that inside diameter and also to get this area roughed up as rough as possible so we get a good bond. Now it's critical to get these areas roughed up with 80 grit paper and I want to leave enough room for what I'm going to try to do is make a little fillet of JB Well there. And JB Weld this far back in the pipe should be fine. You never really know. But even if this part were to come off, there'd be no catastrophic damage. It just would be a little bit louder. My friend John Pothia came up with this. These are little, I guess they're tops from water bottles. Anyway, he sent me a bunch of them. This is a perfect thing to use for mixing up the JB Weld. Use a little flux brush. Now, you know, with JB Weld, we could use pipe resin. I don't think pipe resin is going to be any better. 
and then we'd have to post cure it again so I don't really want to post cure a pipe that's already soaked with oil and this in the past has worked you just can't do this every time up in the front of the pipe especially toward the back this shouldn't be a problem again because it's a spare pipe this is not the primary pipe that Kim's going to be using we can we can kind of do a little experiment here what we want to do is get a nice bead You can remember the old days when you take your car to a mechanic and he'd fix an alternator or fix a starter or do things? Well, nobody fixes anything anymore. You take a car and they replace, they unplug the motor and put a new one in. Well, we're trying to go back to kind of the old days when people used to know, first of all, they had to know how to fix them and then have the energy level to do it. Now, the, the key part with this cone, I'll call this the, the tail cone for lack of a better word, is we want to get a, a it's purposely left rough inside. And to get a bond, we need to get it even rougher. The rougher, the better. And this will save Kim basically a hundred bucks. So, and if it doesn't work, he can holler at me and return the other material I sent him. But we'll give it our best, the best try we can at getting him what will amount to be a spare extra pipe. Rather than just deep six in this. Hey! Get out of here. Oh man, this is all I need. Get away! JB Weldbird is over here. Okay, now we're going to have to sit this. First get a good bond and first get some heat on this just to... Uh, get! Jeez! JB Bird, get out of here. He's got to check everything out. I'm not kidding, Chucky. You're going to... I'm not kidding. Now we'll let that dry overnight. See how that hardens up. We may want to put some half ounce cloth, another layer of JB Weld and some half ounce cloth. I'm not sure. I'm going to see how strong that is tomorrow when I come back to it. Well, the pipe dried up well. Today we're going to ship it back out to Kim, get his opinion of, well, we'll see how that back end holds on. Again, there's no guarantee on a repair like this, but if we can salvage one, all part of crash repairs. And the countdown begins, if you only knew. We have the calendar set and we're crossing the days off like a man that's in prison on his sentence to die or something just can't wait to get this guy in the air as well as I'm sure the whole crew that participated in the development and building and Chicky he just can't leave us alone it's just unbelievable and even dub jet is excited about the possibility of seeing this in the air getting some video and the hundreds and hundreds of hours of work that we put into this it's very soon gonna come to our well one way or another, the adventure is going to continue. And that's what life really is, an adventure. And if you know where you're going, you're not, a, not much of an adventure at all. Just a little reminder. Last year we made the tape up of all of Paul Walker's B-17 flights. It turned out to be a very popular tape. A lot of people enjoyed it because and needless to say, not everybody can afford to be at the Nats or fly out to Seattle and see the plane. Well, the video allows us to do that. This year we've done the same thing with all the flights of Paul's P-51 with the Sato 56. I just hope that's going to help people enjoy the hobby more and get to see a part of it that maybe, uh, you know, some of the Walker fly-offs and things. We've been competing with Paul for a lot of years and we've enjoyed every one of them. There isn't one I... I wouldn't want to live over again.
And we hope to see you on the next tape. Got some real interesting things coming up. We, we have to start answering that phone.